Welcome to Crazy Horse Memorial. Our purpose was firmly established by Boston-born sculptor Korchak Chokovsky way back in 1948, before he set off the first blast. The purpose was and still remains to tell the story of the Indians of North America and provide a positive view of their culture and heroes. The purpose of this video at Crazy Horse Memorial is to tell the story of a series of amazing relationships between Indians and whites that led to this gigantic mountain carving, and also to tell you about its continuing and building legacy of the Indian Museum of North America and the University of North America. These black hills are our, our big cathedral, our place of worship. And we, we believe that this, this good land of ours here is, is sacred to us. Before the 1800s, native tribes roamed free over a huge expanse of land west of the Missouri River. Geologic evidence, cave art, and storytelling among tribal groups shows the Plains States and the Black Hills have been inhabited for several millennia. It's estimated there were 60 to 80 million Indians in tribes stretching from Canada to Texas California to Tennessee. The warrior Crazy Horse was born as a member of the Oglala Lakota tribe near Rapid Creek on the edge of the Black Hills about 1840 and grew up with the traditional ways of the Lakota, preparing him for his future life as a warrior for the tribe. As with tradition, he was not named Crazy Horse. He started out as Curly, possibly because he had wavy hair. Later, after he proved himself in battle, Curly earned his father's name, Crazy Horse, Tashunga Witko, which means his horse is crazy. Over the decades, there have been several old pictures that have been claimed to be an image of Crazy Horse. These have been investigated, and there is no known picture of Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse was said to have asked those who requested a photograph, would you imprison my shadow too? Korchak said the features of his gigantic mountain carving came from descriptions from those who knew the great warrior, including survivors of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Those who knew him described his character as introspective. Crazy Horse is said to have always thought before speaking. Crazy Horse lost his mother as a boy and in his early teens witnessed an attack by the army on an Indian camp. It started as a misunderstanding over a stolen cow from a passing homesteader. As the years went on, encroaching miners and settlers to the plains and the Black Hills triggered a number of Indian wars which lasted 23 years. When he was old enough, Crazy Horse set out on one of the most important rites of passage to a Lakota warrior, a vision quest, or Hamle Chea, divined as crying for a vision. By his teens, Crazy Horse was a full-fledged warrior. Black Elk, a respected Indian elder, once said, it was a vision that gave Crazy Horse his great power, that he could not be hurt. In 1876, Crazy Horse led a band of Lakota warriors against Custer's 7th U.S. Cavalry Battalion. At the time, it was called the Battle of the Little Big Horn, or Custer's Last Stand. Native Americans call it the Battle of the Greasy Grass. Many Native Americans look on that battle as a victory over the much stronger force. After the battle, the U.S. government rounded up Northern Plains tribes that resisted. Crazy Horse continued to resist 
And in 1877, under a flag of truce, Crazy Horse went to Fort Robinson, Nebraska. Negotiations broke down, possibly because of incorrect translation. As Crazy Horse was escorted to jail, Crazy Horse struggled and drew his knife, and his friend Little Big Man tried to restrain him. It's recorded that an infantry guard made a lunge with a bayonet and mortally wounded the great warrior. Depending on the description of those who witnessed his death, Crazy Horse died that evening or early the next day. His parents transported him to his resting place, and the exact location is said to be a secret to this day. The next chapter of the Crazy Horse story begins with the birth of Standing Bear near Pierce, South Dakota, along the Missouri River, probably 1874. In his early teens, he became one of the first Native Americans to attend Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, where he took on the name of Henry, chosen at random from a list of names. For most, all traces of their traditional Indian lives were suddenly and forcefully removed, beginning with the hair which was cut short. Traditional clothing was removed and destroyed. Speaking the tribal language was punished severely with the intent to remake them into the image preferred by the leaders of the school. Results of this process varied over the decades as it was carried out in Indian boarding schools across the country. Standing Bear, as a result of attending Carlisle, says he concluded that in order to best help his people, it would be necessary to learn the ways of the non-native world. He began to develop leadership skills like public speaking and writing. He realized that the battle for cultural survival was no longer to be waged with weapons, but with words and ideas. He became a strong proponent of education. He attended college in Chicago while he worked for Sears Roebuck Company. As a result of his education and the willingness to engage the non-Indian world, he became heavily involved in the affairs of his people over the course of his life. There was another important story at about the same time, which in many ways seems to parallel the life of Henry Standing Bear. Sculptor Korczak Czukowski was born in Boston of Polish descent. He suddenly became an orphan at age one. He grew up in a series of foster homes and was badly mistreated. At age 16, Korczak earned money at odd jobs and put himself through Ringe Technical School in Cambridge. As a young man, Korczak's friendship with the family of Boston juvenile judge Pickering Cabot launched his interest in the art world. He made the most of his many natural gifts to teach himself the ability to create a legacy of many admired and award-winning works over the years in wood and stone. And I always said I wanted to do something worthwhile in my life. And I wanted to become a sculptor. And one day when I was 13, I read about this man, Bolton, Carly Moon. No thinking that about 16 years later, I was only working as his assistant in our restaurant. Then I got a letter from this old Indian I'd never met, standing there. And he asked if I'd build a memorial for dead people so the white people know that the men had great heroes also. Well, I brought myself up. Being American of Polish descent, I thought that was a, it wasn't too much to ask for. And I had no place to go, so I decided to give my life to it. It was Chief Standing Bear who invited Korchak to the Black Hills. His letter said, my fellow chiefs and I would like the white man to know the Red Man has great heroes also. Arriving at Crazy Horse in 1947 and living in a tent the first seven months, Korchak built the log studio home using pine trees from the property. In a way, it was pioneering because then there was nothing at Crazy Horse, only rocks and trees, no roads, water, or electricity. But you imagine how, how humble I got in the mountain. I sat on the side of the studio jacket, the family, and the field. And I built my old around three small teachings in both lawns. Then I brought an old confessor who was 24 years old, no Buddha. 
So we could for the years, I climbed up 741 steps and I carried it, sitting up on my back. When I go up, I stopped the big compressor. I used to crank it, you know, and I put a 50 pound box of dynamite in one shoulder, put a wire and a string of bits around my neck. The old Buddha, the old compressor was kind of decrepit and I'd get sometimes four of the way up and I'd just hear that thing go kaput, 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 Put everything down, walk all the way down the staircase, start up again, crank it up, wait there five minutes, start up the mountain, pick everything up, go up to the top, which is quite a distance, just start to do one roll, get down about a foot, and you can hear the big Buddha. Kaput, the kaput, the kaput. Down I'd go again. One day I did that nine times. You know, the kids off the road. Oh, I think that walk up and down here is terrible. Kochak promised to tell the story of Stone and to build a non profit educational and cultural memorial. So strongly did he believe in the humanitarian purpose of Crazy Horse, he twice turned down $10 million in federal funding for the project. He did not believe the government would carry out the important cultural and educational goals or complete the mountain carving, which he knew would take much longer than one man's lifetime. Indian elders picked Crazy Horse as the subject of the carving. Korchak, of course, was in charge of the mountain and did all of that, on, and even though we planned the books together, uh, without him, there wouldn't be a crazy horse, and I'm perfectly willing to give him all that credit. But he said before he passed away that he couldn't carve crazy horse from the grave, that there were things that we would have to do on our own decisions that I would have to make. And one of the hardest decisions in the world, and it took two years to decide after he passed away, was that we were not going to carve the horse's head, which is what Korchak would have done. We were going to do Crazy Horse's face first. And he left it so that a big share of the rock was gone in front of the face, and we had to clear it down to the arm and get ready to go to work on it. But it was far more ready to work on than the horse's head was. And looking back on it now, I know we made the right decision. If I do nothing but help have a good foundation and a good direction with the models and the scanning and the rock support for when I'm gone and somebody else comes along, they can just carry on. If I were to think that all this was was just a portrait of a man on a horse, and that was a, a, a tourist gimmick. Um, it's one of Dad's uh, greatest things was that education is the one thing that will get us further down the road, no matter who we are. Or what we're going into. I feel the monument is a, a great tribute to the Indian. It would give us a better hold of ourselves as to who we are, not what we are trying to be. And I think uh, identity and individualism is essential to our Indian people. Hopefully this monument would create some idea in that direction. It's a model, I think, of what's possible uh, when there's an appreciation for uh, the value, inherent value, of the human lives who were here uh, a long time, for centuries, before uh, this country got established as a United States or uh, organized through uh, immigrations that came later. When I think about Crazy Horse Memorial, and I think about the foundation, and I think about uh, what's going on here with the university and the museum, it's very important. It, it's about uh, a convergence of cultures. It's about an understanding and an empathy uh, between human beings. And that's, well, I can't think of anything any more important than that. I really do love the idea behind this and the family who's behind it is really dedicated to this. Uh, it represents two things to me. It represents the integrity of our elders who asked Korshek to build a monument 
honoring one of our chiefs and our sacred black hills. And that is a commitment we should never lose sight of. That we are still here. We do have our culture and language intact yet today. But it amazes me that it's uh, the commitment that the family has put into it, Ruth and Korja. I think it's I think it's really great considering that Standing Bear actually asks a white person to carve a monument for Native Americans. Korchak also carved helped carve Mount Rushmore. And so when Standing Bear asked him to carve this, I was I thought it was amazing that he agreed to it. I, I see them as pretty inspirational because then they took on something bigger than they actually were. And like how the mountain isn't complete but just because of what he did, future generations are going to continue working on it.